So the mission of SR3 is to promote the health and welfare of marine wildlife in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and the vision here is that we can bring the, the status of the wildlife here back to a point where it can flourish. I think we can all agree it's, it's not flourishing right now, especially if we look at our, our southern residents or if we look at our sea stars, um, things are not going well for those critters. So we're really focusing on that health and welfare component. And um, our organization is made up of a combination of veterinarians like myself and marine biologists. So what is my background? Um, I am actually, don't tell anyone, but I'm a bird person. <laughs> so um, I grew up completely fascinated with birds and with raptors um, and, and spent my childhood doing uh, wildlife rehabilitation work uh, back when children could be um, involved in such things. <laughs> they don't allow children to get the rabies vaccine at age nine, like I did. Um, but uh, that was my childhood. Um, after I went to vet school, uh, I've been involved in a variety of conservation projects, um, spent quite a few months out on that horrible atoll there um, doing a rat eradication campaign actually to save some endangered shorebirds. Um, I then worked at Lincoln Park Zoo focusing on rabies eradication and wildlife health in the Serengeti. From there I came to the Seattle Aquarium where I was their uh, staff veterinarian for the last five years. And then just this last October um, we started SR3, which is the new uh, program that we're here to talk about which really fills a gap in the Pacific Northwest. We'll talk more about what that gap is. Um, but I also work for Sarvi Wildlife Care Center, which is up in Arlington, and that's where I still get my bird fix. Um, so they do amazing work with raptors and other wildlife up there. So who are we? Right now, um, SR3 has four staff, myself, executive director and veterinarian, Casey McLean, who's a veterinary nurse. Um, we have Holly Fernbach, who I'll talk about. And then we just hired Doug Sandilance, who is a marine biologist and disentanglement expert. So his background has been in disentangling large whales from marine debris. And so we're bringing that expertise to Washington so that we can get a program here to do that. So if we have a large whale entangled in Washington, we're going to have a team, a nimble team of people who can go out and disentangle that whale. We also have Andrew here today, who's one of our consultants. Um, that's him with his daughter uh, petting a squirrel. We don't do squirrels, but we do at Sarvi. <laughs> and then we're lucky to have Laura also as part of our team. Becca? <laughs> so we've got a really great team of, of people. Um, and then we're also associated with UW. So um, I'm faculty at UW as part of the Center for One Health Research, and this program is um, associated with UW. We also have an amazing board. Um, so we've got people like Joe Gatos, um, who is uh, part of CDOC Society. Show of hands, people who know CDOC Society. Yeah, right? They're pretty cool. So they are also part of this and supporting our efforts. Um, and we also have Raven Sky River. If you have not checked out Raven Sky River's work, I know everyone in here loves marine stuff. So if you <laughs> Google Raven Sky River, he does the most amazing glass work. Um, so definitely check him out. And then we're, of course, collaborative with NOAA, uh, WDFW, and US Fish and Wildlife, because they really direct what we do as an organization. So what we've been up to um, since we started last October, we have done uh, the first ever uh, sea lion disentanglements in Washington. So it was one of the first things we did. So this is a sedated, not dead, California sea lion. Um, so this is a, a, a new technique that we're able to sedate these guys that would be otherwise too dangerous for us to get close to. And then we remove the debris usually around their neck and figure out what it is. So the goal of this program is to disentangle enough animals that we can say for sure what the main causes of entanglements are and then make policy changes so that these things don't get into our oceans. So um, this guy was disentangled off the coast. We actually spotted him the next day happily grooming and um, sunning, and, and I'm sure he's doing well. So you know those white packing straps? People always ask, well, how does that get out there? Um, and it's actually a byproduct of the fishing industry. Packing straps are wrapped around um, bait boxes, like herring. Um, so what happens is when they're um, baiting the lines, the packing strap just goes. We want to be able to show if that's the most common form of entanglement here, it'll add a lot of momentum to the lose the loop campaign where we're trying to make these biodegradable so that they fall off because they're such strong material that they stay on their necks and unfortunately it's a not a good outcome for these animals. Plus it's incredibly painful, right? So these actually dig into their neck. So we disentangled two animals that had packing straps on their neck. And this was collaborative with actually Vancouver Aquarium Marine Science Center and that's Joe Gatos from Sea Doc Society. And you can't tell that's me <laughs> because I'm dressed up like a little Yeti, but I was really cold. Um, so it was, it was a very cold day. But yeah, we're really happy to be kind of spearheading that program here in Washington and um, freeing these guys from these entanglements. Any questions about that before I move on to talking about killer whales? This is everyone's favorite. And I have to preface this with 
My expertise is more pinnipeds and sea otters, but we have a, a, a wonderful uh, killer whale expert who's right now in Antarctica, and so I'm speaking on her behalf. Um, so if I can't answer your question, I'll ask her and she'll get back to you. So these guys, southern resident killer whales, are the largest members actually of the dolphin family, and they get their name actually because they kill whales. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, I actually have, for someone in the audience, who can answer this question. So can anyone here give me three other names for a killer whale? Three at once. Yeah. That's, yes, okay, scientific name, but do you know other, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, <laughs> it's the youngest member here who knows their scientific name. Um, there's, there's a couple other names that they get that are kind of unusual. We're really close. Blackfish is one. One starts with an O, and I think everyone said it. There's one more that's a really odd one. If anyone gets it, they're going to get this hat. Yes, but you, you <laughs> sorry, Grampus. Killer whales are, are their kind of preferred scientific name. So it's like saying um, starfish versus sea stars, right? We prefer to say sea stars, but let's all be honest, it's totally fine to say starfish, um, and no one should get their wrist slapped for that. Other names, orcas, Grampus, blackfish. Everything comes in threes with these guys. There's three ecotypes, three resident populations, and then, of course, down here, the, the famous ones are the three pods that are popular or that, that live down here, J, K, and L. And then they're also worldwide. So these guys live kind of everywhere. They're very um, successful at adapting to a variety of different ecosystems. Um, and uh, Holly, who's down in Antarctica right now, has gotten some amazing pictures of um, animals down there that have that lighter color, so it's kind of cool, the variations. Unfortunately, though, um, as of December of this last year, um, the SRK population, SRKW population is down to 78. So that's pretty low. Um, that's one of the lowest it's ever been. Uh, last year we lost six individuals. One was a boat strike. One was, we're not sure. Um, this is a sad image of the, um, of the calf. It had a bunch of uh, rake marks and stuff on it as the adults were trying to keep it up, they suspect, um, as it got very weak. So it was a really rough year um, for the southern residents. And I meant to mention in the slide prior, as far as like the kind of the go-to for information on SRKWs, I highly recommend the Center for Whale Research. So if you haven't checked out their website, definitely do that. Um, Whale Scout also has amazing information on their website. So what are we doing? So Holly Fernbach um, has uh, pioneered with several collaborators the drone method of collecting um, respiratory secretions so we can get more information about the health of the animals. But also a really important thing that she's doing is looking at the animals from above to get their body condition. So I know that might seem weird, but it's a way for us to non-invasively figure out, like, are they fat? Are they skinny? How is their calf growing? And so this photogrammetry um, allows us to take the picture from a certain height consistently and then be able to figure out the weight of the animal. And so that's a really cool thing to be able to do because otherwise there's no way just looking at the dorsal fin, you know, from the side that we'd be able to figure out how the animals are doing. So this is really groundbreaking research that helps us figure out how the pods are doing um, in relation to the fish numbers, other stressors in the environment. So this is just more pictures kind of of the um, hexacopter and also of an example of the same animal when it's both skinny from above and then when it's doing well. And so you can really tell the difference for these guys. It's not, it's not hard. They use a mathematical program and computers to actually do the calculations and figure out the body weight, but you can just see from the pictures. People always ask, well, what's causing the SRKW decline? It's likely very multifactorial, but of course salmon, which is a big topic here, is, is very important. They are a specialist predator, only eating certain types of salmonids, and so with endangered salmon populations, it's not surprising that these guys are endangered too. Um, but we also have issues, you know, with noise, with toxins, um, and with a lot of other things going on. So there's there's a lot of different challenges that these guys are facing, and we're, and we're trying to figure out what what is the most important thing we can do to help them get through this and and start to recover um, instead of continuing this decline. SR3 is also starting. Um, to increase our, our study of whales in the Salish Sea. Because I mentioned, you know, humpbacks are here now. They haven't been here before. So we need to figure out, like, what types, like, what ages? Are these all juveniles coming into the Salish Sea? Adults? Do they have entanglement scars? How are they doing? How's their body condition score? So we're going to start this year really expanding the whale health program in the area to figure out what's going on. And then, as I mentioned, we've hired Doug Sandiland. So he's coming in to start our disentanglement program in the area. This is a picture of a humpback whale that Doug disentangled on the East Coast. 
Um, and this humpback is actually what we call hogtied. This is a really severe entanglement that goes through his mouth and then wraps around his flukes. And so he wasn't even really able to surface fully and swim normally. And actually, Doug, um, it took three days. These efforts are really intensive. They had to follow the animal, figure out what was going on, and then make the strategic cuts. Because you don't have multiple approaches to these guys. And you don't want to stress them out too much. So it's a very time intensive and very strategic thing to do. And it takes years to learn how to do this. So we're really lucky to have him out here. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, what's going on with our program in relation to whales and whale health in the region, um, both disentanglement and SRKWs. This map really brings me to why SR3 was created. In all of the other regions in North America, there are facilities or centers dedicated to caring for stranded or injured marine wildlife. So Washington and Oregon are unique in that we don't have a facility like that. And so SR3 was created to really fill that gap. In British Columbia, Alaska, California, all along the East Coast, there are centers that will respond to these stranded or injured marine animals and have dedicated hospitals and rehabilitation facilities that are coupled with science centers that help us understand what's going on. So that is actually one of the main reasons that we exist is to help fill that gap up here and help people like Robin <laughs> deal with um, stranded seals. So Right now, um, PAWS is an amazing facility, a wildlife rehabilitation facility, and they are wonderful in that they take quite a few harbor seal pups every year. Their capacity is around six animals per year. And just to give you a reference for how many seals per year um, just north of us are rehab, so the, the Marine Mammal Rescue Center at Vancouver Aquarium does anywhere between 150 and 200 harbor seal pups a year. So, um, you know, six, like, Poor Paws is, is always being like, hey, can you take more? Can you take more? And they get full very early in the year, and we're not able to respond to a lot of other strandings. They also um, can't take adult pinnipeds, adult um, sea lions or seals, um, harbor porpoise, and a lot of other species that strand here, or sea turtles. So we're really trying to fill a niche to be able to respond to all these other critters. Um, right now, one of the things we do is if it's an endangered critter, like a Guadalupe fur seal, We'll stabilize it up here, and then we'll actually ship it down to California. We can do better, <laughs> and that's why we're here. So a lot of people ask, why is wildlife rehabilitation important? Especially with harbor seals, right? Because harbor seals are at their carrying capacity, so why should we rehabilitate them? Wildlife rehabilitation is only done for the, the purpose of surveillance and teaching and all these other reasons. It's not usually done to maintain the population levels unless it's an endangered species. And then, yes, rehabilitation is, like with the Hawaiian monk seals, incredibly important for the population because there's so few animals left. Um, but human interactions, intentional and not, are common issues. So it, unfortunately, it's more common than you guys would probably like to know how many animals are shot. At the Wildlife Rehabilitation Center that I work at, Sarvi, roughly 30 to 40% of our patients are actually gunshot. So it's a really common issue, even in the Seattle area. But then monitoring ocean health. These guys give us a window onto ocean health that we otherwise wouldn't have. Rehabilitating these guys is like hooking up a monitor to the ocean and to figure out what's going on. It also helps us build knowledge. So for this, this is Tucker in the hyperbaric chamber. We learned a lot about <coughs> sea turtles and their physiology just through that one case. Helps train future generations of both biologists and veterinarians. And it also promotes that coexistence piece, which is so important. Um, because I hope that by the time I retire, we're not seeing 30 to 40 percent of the animals coming through these centers being gunshot cases. And that really comes down to helping people understand the interaction between wildlife and their livelihood. Um, gunshot cases are usually probably the result of people thinking that that bald eagle is going to take their cat or their poultry or other issues. So um, kind of informing people about their important role in the environment. I have another uh, question. Let's see if I have, I have more stuff to give away, of course. Um, can anyone tell me what that is? Oh, oh, nice, Paquito. Yes, how am I supposed to give away that many things? Um, so uh, there's only 30 Vaquita left. Um, and so I, I wanted to talk about this. This picture was here to remind me of the, the question of, we also get the question a lot of, are you going to um, take animals from the rehabilitation center that are not releasable and put them under human care and captive um, institutions? And ultimately, that's not SR3's kind of decision. We're leaving that to NOAA and other partners. But we're definitely not against it. And I wanted to um, use this example, not because we want to take vaquitas in to, to do a captive breeding program, but because the, one of the ways that we've been able to track vaquita is by studying harbor porpoise that are um, actually under human care at the Vancouver Aquarium. And so having animals under human care allows us to do amazing conservation research. And this guy is just an example, because we wouldn't be able to track these guys and find them without working with those harbor porpoise. So there's, there's 
definitely some conservation ties to having these critters in those type of roles. So I just wanted to mention that. Any questions about that or wildlife rehabilitation in general? What are you going to say when someone asks you, why would you re rehabilitate a harbor seal? You tell them there's so many reasons. <laughs> <laughs> so who needs rehab in Washington? Um, this cutie, that cutie, that cutie, that cutie. Lots of amazing animals need rehabilitation here. And it all goes to serve science, teaching, and a better understanding of our marine health in the Pacific Northwest. Um, that's a fur seal, which is one of my favorite species. We're also going to be helping birds, seabirds, um, shorebirds, uh, because again, I'm a bird person, so we won't just be focusing on mammals. Uh, but there's a lot of different species here that, that need that. So next steps for us, um, we're in the process of fundraising for a mobile hospital or just an ambulance so we can go out to the beaches, respond to these injured animals, get them into a safe space where we can do a health assessment, figure out whether they're candidates for rehabilitation, um, we're also going to have kind of an autopsy unit where if these animals aren't um, really good candidates for rehabilitation, we can do a complete autopsy and figure out why they stranded in the first place, which helps us learn so much about ocean health. So it's a really important thing to do. We're also in the process of creating a small rehabilitation facility, kind of a short-term facility that can hopefully open this spring and summer to respond to animals while we focus on building a larger facility that would open in the next three to five years. So we hope to have that open soon. And then we're trying to build capacity for the southern resident killer whale work that Holly does um, by acquiring a new vessel um, that will support that work, um, but will also support the disentanglement efforts. So those are our big pushes for this year that we're trying to accomplish. And everyone asks how you can help. There's so many different ways. You guys are already involved in so many nonprofits, a lot of you guys here. Um, so, you know, keep doing what you're doing. SR3 will be taking volunteers too. Spread the word. A lot of people don't know there's only 78 southern resident killer whales left. So spread the word. Get that out there. Um, and then, you know, if it's something you want to donate towards, donate. So we really appreciate all support though. And time for more questions. Does anyone else have questions? Great question. Why doesn't the aquarium have a hospital for stuff like this? So the aquarium is very space limited on those piers. Um, and their mission is really focused on inspiring conservation of the marine environment and kind of educating children. And they're an amazing institution, but this is not you know, kind of their mission or what they want to do, and they don't have the space to do it. Um, and so you know, it really requires a separate organization to come in. Um, but you know, they have an amazing platform for education. They get almost a million visitors every year and, and do a great job of telling the story about what's important um, in the marine environment. So we'll be collaborating with them to kind of tell those stories and, and uh, collaborate on research as well. Great question about oil spills. So what would our role be and, and how would we work together in an oil spill event for marine animals? Yeah, so right now there's very limited capacity to respond for marine animals. Um, and so we are, are going to be helping kind of coordinate that response in this state. So um, one of our board members is Dr. Michael Zaccardi, who is the president of the Oil Wildlife Care Network down in California that kind of oversees oil wildlife response in the whole country. Um, and so he's going to be helping us work together with local orgs to develop plans for responding to critters up here. And then one of our uh, pieces of the puzzle will be actually the, the response capacity. So both <coughs> responders for the animals, but then the, the tanks and everything to rehab the animals in. So awesome to see all you guys. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. We appreciate it. And feel free to check out all the information. And Thank you. <laughs>